my topic is about supporting reflective writing in the disciplines and it relates to um, Deb's discussion about reflection earlier on and also to uh, Vittoria and Caroline's discussion about uh, collaboration I think and there are several sessions uh, later on um, which relate to this idea of uh, supporting uh, academic writing, academic literacies in disciplines. Um, I've uploaded the slides to a website there and I've given you uh, a convenient address, I hope to look it up, on tinyearl.com supporting reflective writing. And there's my email as well in case you want to follow up with any uh, queries. Okay, so everyone hearing me okay after that preamble? Let's kick it off. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is what I'm hoping to cover in the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, I won't read all those words out. You can just have a quick look for a moment. <clears throat> what I'm really um, hoping to talk about here is just to give you an example of a piece of um, supporting academic writing within a couple of uh, courses and then maybe raising some issues um, possibly regarding um, <clears throat> boundaries and expertise which I think are sort of perennial issues in our um, profession. So um, I'm working here at Massey University, uh, one of New Zealand's universities um, I'm sure you'll be very aware of the type of context which we work in as a modern university. Um, I feel that a growing number of courses are introducing academic writing um, broadly part of the move towards a more vocational focus um, here on the campus. Um, we have a nursing uh, social work, um, engineering, I work and I'm going to refer to a speech and language therapy program and um, any number of other programs particularly in business maybe where um, some more traditional written assignments are being replaced by um, reflective journals which are based on either uh, an actual placement which students are on or on students remembering some experience that they've had. Um, for example, that's the case with one of the postgraduate leadership assignments that I work on. I think the first issue I want to talk about is what we mean by um, reflective writing and I'm going to use the metaphor of buildings to try and demonstrate how I feel about the difference and why it's a challenge for students. So if we start off with kind of the default, the classic kind of writing that we associate with universities, we have the essay. And this is a building, when I was a teacher in London I used to often take students on uh, visits to some of these institutions and in those days they all had visitor centers. Now they closed them all down for security reasons but we used to take the students in this building, it's uh, the Bank of England. And for me it's representative in some way of what the essay is supposed to be, okay, this classical form. And like the um, building itself, I think an essay is supposed to have this harmonious structure. Um, it's static. If you look at that um, building, you can see nothing going on. It's all hidden. And I think as well with the essay, it's supposed to be sort of a final outcome of a process of thinking. And by the time you sit down to write the essay, uh, there's an expectation that you've finished off uh, agonizing and wondering and you're ready to present that sort of polished argument. 
And the other thing about that building is it's strong. It presents its best face forward. And again, it's this aspect of it being complete. You are able to present a, an argument which uh, is finished and therefore coherent and persuasive. Okay, so that is in a sense where we're coming from in terms of our ideal for um, academic writing. Reflection, I think, in some ways is the other side of the coin or the extreme version. And this is another building we used to go and take groups of students to, um, and we used to go up that um, elevator there and sort of stare out at goings on on the floor. And it, it's the Lloyds building in London. And I mean, it's quite a different structure. And it's considered, you know, part of the postmodern movement in architecture. And I think that in some ways reflection, reflective writing, is a sort of postmodern turn in in our topic of writing and study. It's not harmonious. I mean, it's damned ugly as a building, all things sticking out. It's discordant. And there's a lot going on. It's not still. It's not polished and complete. Um, it gives an impression of building as a dynamic process, um, emergent and in the process of construction. It almost looks like it's still being built. And I think that's how reflective writing is supposed to come across as um, busy and emergent. And there might be some threads that go nowhere, but then it gets picked up again, uh, which would be uh, considered inappropriate in an essay. And the other thing about it is it's vulnerable because it's a kind of inside out structure. You see the classical building defends itself. It surrounds itself with this solid marble wall and um, its inner workings are protected. But this postmodern building puts them all on the outside and it's almost like that famous um, uh, saying by Iago in, in Othello, where he says, um, should I wear my heart on my sleeve for doors to peck at? And reflective writing is like that. It introduces a kind of vulnerability because you're um, externalizing your um, process of wondering, your doubts, your hesitations. Um, so it's a much more vulnerable form of writing, I think, than uh, essays. So it's no <clears throat> trivial matter to um, transfer from this traditional kind of writing to asking students to do uh, reflective writing. And um, that brings me on to um, the idea that um, Apart from this, these general features of, of reflective writing, there's also a certain amount of variation um, which is related to the um, ethos, I think, of different uh, subject areas and disciplines and professions. Um, in some of these vocational courses, there's um, a somewhat narrow definition of reflection which is to do with um, students essentially documenting to what extent they've achieved certain competencies which they're required to demonstrate as part of their um, professional accreditation. Okay, And uh, this is an example from uh, quite a, an important um, ongoing assignment within speech and language therapy that's connected to their clinical practice paper. And as you can see, you know, for each range of practice, you uh, reflect on your competency development. And essentially, the competencies are predetermined principles, 
which you then need to use as a yardstick to measure your progress. Okay. Um, another broader um, uh, interpretation of reflection is related very closely to the idea of critical thinking, which after all is one of those um, uh, buzzwords around universities and often appears in some way in graduate attributes um, or um, uh, learning outcomes of particular courses. Um, and it's related to uh, a definition by Dewey which I've included in full in the word handout. Um, this is an example of a management um, assignment for which I've prepared some of the materials that you're going to see later. Um, but as you can see, in this case, the lecturer has asked them to recall what he calls vignettes. Um, he's got almost entirely international students in this paper um, from India. Uh, the last year, they're India, Burma, um, Iraq, Iran, China, etc. And um, none of them knew what a vignette was. <laughs> I mean, it's not. Uh, no one knows. I mean, it was it was unclear why he chose that word. Anyway, um, what he meant was he wanted them to to recall some incidents of uh, leadership, and then to apply uh, some kinds of theory to the um, to analyze the uh, experiences. But in this case, those are not predetermined uh, authoritative principles in the profession. They're theories in a highly contested field. So um, uh, students are expected to approach them and apply them in a far more measured and critical way. <clears throat> Going even broader, you can say that reflection ought to include a kind of wholeness of your development as a person and a professional. So that includes an opportunity to process the affective nature of experience as well. And um, this is, has been very much the case in uh, professions such as social work. Uh, here's the journal from the um, Masters of Applied Social Work program. Um, I've highlighted there, um, include personal thoughts, impressions, questions, struggles. I mean, this is getting very much dear diary, isn't it? And you'll be evaluated on your personal growth. That's a long way from what we saw in the earlier um, definitions of reflection. So you've got a much broader scope. Okay, so this idea that reflection can um, be interpreted differently, and in particular in terms of uh, a narrow sort of competency basis, or critical thinking interpretation, or this holistic interpretation of personal growth, um, kind of feeds into the idea about why it might be uh, problematic to our students to write reflective accounts that are going to be assessed. So obviously lecturers um, may not realize that asking students to reflect is an ambiguous instruction. And as uh, you might also um, imagine, they may not um, appreciate the complexity of reflective discourse. Um, and I'm going to return to that a bit later. And in addition, I think in particular in relation to reflective writing, there's a reluctance to provide a lot of guidance, in particular in the form of models, partly because they feel that it might cramp the student's style, that reflection is idiosyncratic, it's personal, and um, so it should come out of the students rather than being based on some kind of external model. Um, Sometimes if they do give a model, I found it very unhelpful, 
particularly from the perspective maybe of uh, international students who, who I'm working with. Um, very often the student, the, the lecturer is going to choose an, an A or A plus example, which is often written by a local domestic student, for example, in management, and tends to be very highly colloquial. And um, the content as well is, is something which um, the students can't really relate to. So it ends up kind of making them feel disempowered rather than being uh, something that's going to assist them in constructing their own uh, reflective account. Um, I <clears throat> worked with one particular um, management lecturer on one of these uh, projects and this is what he had to say about it. There's nothing to talk about. I think is a very clear um, expression of uh, a certain point of view um, which is not informed by uh, a knowledge of discourse and discourse analysis and how we learn, uh, how we are acculturated into uh, certain discourses. Um, it's the idea that um, uh, this writing will just pour out of the students and then it can be kind of shaped. Anyway, um, he had a very, um, uh, how should I say, um, he was fairly strong in his belief on that point, but at the same time quite um, amenable to me going in and providing a more structured account. And that's why it was a very made for a very interesting um, relationship, I think. Um, he felt that um, I had a different role, a different perspective. He was very happy with me um, providing um, the sort of uh, structured, scaffolded help that he himself felt it was an imp inappropriate to give. OK. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll try and come back to that later on, but I think it, it um, raises questions about the relationship uh, that we might have with certain um, topic specialists and the um, feasibility of, in some way, handing over the um, support that we've developed to academic staff to carry on with. Um, students are less likely to have had any training in reflective writing, there's no reflective writing in IELTS, for example, and um, what happens, therefore, I think, is that in being asked to do reflective writing, students end up defaulting to a kind of writing that they're much more um, familiar with. Yes, and, and I think the point that Simon's making there is, is very, very relevant as well. Um, it, I think it sort of related a little bit to my next point here, which is um, that discomfort in exposing. Go back to that Lloyd's building picture that, you know, I'm putting all of my vulnerable parts on the outside. And that is also like the pictures of the two buildings. It's, it's culturally um, uh, it related to people's cultures and expectations about um, what they'll do in the within the boundary, if you like, of academic work. Um, and so here's one of the students uh, in that course talking about his um, experience in talking to the lecturer about this issue. Do whatever you want. Yeah, the thing is he didn't really want them to do whatever they wanted because, you know, he, he I think he did have an idea about some of the qualities that he was looking for. After all, he was going to assess it. Um, you know, it'd be fine, wouldn't it, asking students to do whatever they wanted, but if they're being assessed on that performance, I think it's a lot to ask. You know, you're asking students to really like Yago, you know, I'm going to wear my heart on my sleeve and um, I'm going to trust that I'm not going to get pecked. Um, 
Okay, so anyway, that's the sort of the context in which I've approached some of these um, uh, collaborations in terms of developing reflective writing. But as has already emerged, as we all know, every relationship that you have with a staff, with another staff member, is unique. Okay, and that this is a very particular lecture with particular values and approaches, um, uh, and others others rather different. So, in terms of going in here, I'm trying to fill this gap. I'm trying to provide a structure. So, what I've um, based it on is a framework for um, uh, re reflection. Yeah, Margaret, that's a very, very, um, very, very neat way of putting it. Um, so, I felt that I wanted a structure that I could use because I wasn't getting anything from the uh, lecturer and the discipline itself. And what I've, what I've based it on is, is quite, a, when you look at descriptive write, um, reflective writing, there are a number of models available, but several of them have this kind of three-part um, structure. So one aspect is that it's descriptive. I mean, after all, um, we expect students to be able to summarize key aspects about the experience which the reflection is based on. Then the next step is for them to pro problematize the experience. In other words, to identify um, questions, gaps, possibly contradictions in their knowledge at the time. And that's where the vulnerability issue comes in. And I felt that unless students are really shown there and given space to do that, it gets missed out. So that brings me uh, to the idea of having a paragraph for each one of these levels, which is where um, I've gone with um, developing my exemplar. <clears throat> And then the next sort of elusive level, uh, often called critical, is where students then attempt to use uh, theory or principles to um, solve or to address those questions and gaps and contradictions that have come up in their analysis. So there's kind of logical flow going on here. And as part of that, arguably as part of that critical reflection that then turns into um, uh, relevant goals for the next stage or for the future, um, which is related to that sort of experiential learning cycle that I think people are familiar with. Um, Kolb, I think, was the main, main character who developed that. And it's also related to um, an action research cycle, essentially, and um, very familiar to all of us. Um, involved in uh, education. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, this is how I went about it. I think that we've all been through this um, sort of structure. I'm just, um, Vanessa's just next to me, and she's been um, involved in doing embedded writing support in um, nursing and engineering, and we've all been through this um, first stage, maybe, of trying to find out what's going on here. So, um, uh, lecturers generally were not very available to have these uh, in-depth conversations, so um, I ended up just reading um, uh, about the topic. Um, fortunately, in, in one of these cases, there are a lot of um, readings available on the um, learning management system for the paper, so I ended up reading quite a lot of this in order to get an idea of the discipline and to come up with um, an exemplar. I ended up writing my own from scratch. Now that's not something that I think probably everyone's going to do, but I just found that the examples um, which I saw of student writing were not, um, didn't lend themselves to the kind of um, exemplars and frameworks that I was looking for. I was looking for something which would give students a structure that they could work with and that would have imitable elements, essentially 
elements that students could could use to scra scaffold their own accounts. And so I decided it's going to be easy stuff. I wrote my own from scratch, and then I could load them with the kinds of features that I thought would be helpful for students to help them to um, to <coughs> include those forms of um, reflection. And then, um, you know, based on <laughs> that earlier Vittoria and Caroline's discussion about um, collaboration, you know, you try and negotiate um, what you can get. And sometimes it ends up being uh, an hour in, uh, in, in, a, in, in a lecture or tutorial time. Sometimes you manage to get the students to come in at a lunchtime or to do something online. And, um, but in one case, the lecturer was so keen on me doing this, the guy who said there's nothing to talk about, um, actually arranged for me to have five one-hour workshops in the space of a single 12-week course. I mean, it's quite a bit. Um, And in those workshops, anyway, depending on the time available, um, I tended to use the exemplars that I wrote um, for various kinds of comprehension tasks, um, then moving to a focus on formal elements that students could, could perhaps pick up, and then to allow them to have some time to discuss their own ideas and to plan their own accounts. Okay, So it's, it's very much a typical um, sort of teaching learning cycle. Um, I found with the... Um, international students that it worked quite well if um, we did a bit of brainstorming about what reflection was. And then I read out bits of my exemplar as a kind of um, oral comprehension. So I just asked them to say, well, what was this situation? Um, what happened here? And then I just read out my first paragraph and then get the students to talk about it, maybe read it again. And then I'd say, OK, so what were, what were the four or five parts of this story? Listen again. Can you identify the different parts of this story? I'd read it again, maybe once or twice. And then they'd break it down into, um, essentially, you know, um, situation, problem, response, outcome, evaluation. And uh, so you know, there was quite a lot of recycling of this exemplar before they even saw it in the written form. And students were actually very positive about that. They enjoyed listening to it. Anyway, um, in the next three slides, I've just given you um, one uh, exemplar that I wrote for a management paper. It's also included in the handout with some other stuff. Um, as you can see here, I've written this um, in order to um, include the descriptive part of reflection in a single paragraph. Okay, And that paragraph has to show these five elements of narrative structure. Okay, So opening situation, which is essentially the first um, uh, three sentences there. And then um, uh, problem, which is the next couple of sentences. Then, uh, uh, then sort of outcome and re response outcome. And that la last sentence, that last mini sentence is intended to be a short evaluation. So anyway, by the time we've gone through that, students, I think, have got an idea that part of a reflective account is essentially telling a story. And you've got to be concise, and you've got to try and include um, several of those elements in your paragraph. One reason to get that in a single paragraph is to avoid the uh, common problem of students just going into storytelling mode for the whole of the account. So here, it's all done in the first paragraph. And then the second paragraph was this um, idea of problematizing the experience. Okay, So um, 
I've tried to load it with a couple of expressions that I thought would be helpful for students to um, write their own accounts. So I've included two uh, rhetorical questions. I've included the expression, it made me wonder. Because I think if students were going to write something and they began a sentence with, this made me think, this made me wonder, they're um, in analytical mode. So it's a very useful um, sentence frame for this particular purpose. Um, OK, so um, that was a paragraph which students, which I was not seeing in any of the examples which I was provided with. And I think it's quite interesting here, because essentially I'm sort of inventing uh, a kind of writing based on this model of reflection. But largely speaking, I'm sort of inventing it. I thought, oh, well, rhetorical questions would be good there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that then gives, gives me the uh, third paragraph, which I'm calling critical. And this is where I'm trying to um, bring in some of the uh, theories which I've read about, because I had a good read through the um, stuff on this uh, course website and then um, to include a couple of um, goals so again I'm loading it with a few imitable expressions like I'm proposing <laughs> I'm I'm offering I need to da. okay um, <clears throat> anyway so um, that was the uh, exemplar that I came up with for a particular um, management course. And um, if you look at the um, handout there, I also um, wrote a rubric for the um, lecturer, sort of to, to try and ensure that what I was asking the students to do was going to match up with the way it was going to be assessed. And again, clearly there, I'm going outside my remit because um, I'm not an academic developer. I'm not really supposed to be um, in the role of, you know, essentially writing an important part of the assessment for a lecturer and sort of showing lecturer how to write an assessment rubric. But um, I, I think that um, you may want to to, to say something about that, but um, I think that a lot of us feel that we work within fairly flexible boundaries, and as long as we've got our eye on the goal of um, supporting and enhancing uh, student learning, that um, you know we can kind of um, we, we can kind of move outside working solely with students in order to achieve that. Anyway, that's what happened in relation to this particular. Um, assignment and I found that um, working with reflective writing um, the lecturers are much more amenable to you um, going in and really sorting out this area because for them I think that, um, that they haven't really given it a lot of thought it's ironic really isn't it because um, you know they're dealing with reflection but um, unreflectively I think in many cases OK, so um, I did some focus groups with students um, in the course. And I also interviewed um, this lecturer as well. So I've got a bit of feedback, generally pretty positive. After all, they weren't getting anything before. So it's got to be better than that. Um, what interested me, though, in particular, I think, was the fact that the students were perfectly uh, happy with the lecturer's general approach. And they could perceive very clearly that we had different goals and our methods were appropriate for our role and our goal. So of course, as someone doing learning support, I was going to be more supportive and provide more explicit guidance. And of course, as this lecturer of the contested 
field of management. Um, he wasn't. And generally, I was kind of interested that um, the students who spoke to me in interviews in the focus group were okay with that. Um, <clears throat> um, they appreciate the fact that I began to know more about their subject and they felt um, therefore um, my advice even in one-to-one -one tutorials if they came sorry consultations um, was going to be more credible because I knew what um, they were supposed to be doing and I, I began to know a bit more about management and uh, they also enjoyed the fact that um, I was sort of going through the process that they were going through because I was also you know reading the stuff I wasn't a management expert and I was writing the stuff um, with them if you like um, again you know it begs the question about whether some of what I was doing might equally have been done by a past mentor or something like that um, the lecturer again was very opposed to that idea he felt that there wasn't anyone who he'd trust and that he wanted someone who was actually an expert on writing and he didn't feel that um, he, it would be an appropriate role for a peer mentor anyway um, Again, the students um, perceived very clearly um, who was the person who had the upper hand in this relationship, if you like, who was the person who was actually going to mark their work. And uh, there was a certain concern among some students that um, we, I would be singing off the same hymn sheet as the lecturer. And finally, um, here was the lecturer's um, summary about, you know, I put to him the idea that, you know, um, I prepared the materials, I've sort of set this up, um, how about um, incorporating some of that into the course itself? You could, you know, you could be doing this. And um, it's interesting because, you know, again, he's, He's in a sense deferring to my expertise as someone who uh, knows about writing and discourse and is the appropriate person to do these. And again, I think it, it, this sort of, and he's not putting me down in any way, um, but he sees a kind of complementarity between us. And I think it does um, uh, raise questions about this um, ideal that has been held in our profession about the idea of embedding support and then being able to walk away because that support has now become part of the curriculum but um, in this case the lecturer doesn't see himself as the right person to be as the best person to be delivering this kind of um, support and as it happened I then did go back the following year and did a, re an, an, a second iteration of this um, support and ended up being recommended to do it for another management paper, um, which I think we, we know that that's the way things go. Okay, so look, I've got... brief conclusions here. We're up to 40 minutes. I'm going to get kicked out of my room in about 10 minutes or so, so um, I'd better get to the conclusion. Um, I'm about done. So um, I've, as I said at the beginning, um, uh, 
those materials are there in the handout. You've got um, the slides online. And um, if you'd like to discuss any questions for the next five minutes or so, I notice the chat is being uh, um, noticeably quiet um, during my presentation. Is that me? Is it the time of day? Mm, just maybe just I'll wind down a bit, create a bit of space for talking. Yeah, Simon, um, this particular lecturer who has been talking is unusual in the sense that he's a qualified teacher. Um, places great emphasis on his teaching role. So he's not one of these people who just won't, who, who just wants to offload stuff necessarily. Um, but I feel that um, uh, he feels his role as a postgraduate management lecturer is to disturb students' um, understanding, to, dis to be disruptive, if you like. And it's based on his view of management and his deeply held beliefs. So um, I think that's part of his reluctance to take on this sort of teaching, which um, might confuse the students. Um, cause Anyway, anyway, so um, and I, and and I think some lecturers may feel that um, they do have this role, this sort of disruptive role, particularly maybe at postgrad level, and it might interfere with their sense that they can be the um, they can be the supported scaffolding uh, sort of teacher as well. Now I feel that yeah, I feel it would be good, but I can understand why the teacher has that view and I think it's um, a principled position um, and it's his course. By the way, we haven't had that sort of approach um, across other disciplines and I think um, Vanessa, who I can see is typing now, has been working with um, nursing staff and I feel that they do possibly again because of their professional ethos. Um, they take a different view and they, they're very amenable to um, both having um, uh, learning consultants coming in but also doing some of that work themselves so there's much more of a kind of continuity between the approaches. So I think in, the, in those cases um, the um, topic specialist let's say um, may be very amenable to adopting um, some of our practices. Um, but I think there may be disciplinary issues and um, issues of ethos and epistemology that might um, uh, cause quite principled resistance to certain um, uh, teaching staff adopting some of our uh, practices which we feel are, um, are consistent with what we know about discourse and how learners acquire academic literacies. Um, uh, but again, some lecturers may feel that's not their role anyway. Yeah, thanks Vanessa, and that's a very good point. And I think that all of us have found, for example, doing these workshops um, has increased the uptake. Um, <clears throat> I've been involved. I've been involved with the speech and language therapy program f over a period of years now. Um, and when I started, very very little engagement with our centre. Very few students would ever come, mostly because they'd been told they had to come, and they're a bit reluctant. Um, but um, during the last year, I had about fifty consultations with speech and language therapy students, so it can have this quite transformative effect on the uh, perception of the centre and the use of the centre. Um, when I was talking to the uh, speech and language uh, therapy students in focus groups, one of them, they had a really, there was a really great focus group I had with them, and they were saying, um, it's, it reminds us of the remedial service at school, you know, 
and you'd only go there if, if you couldn't learn well. And I think that I can understand why they, why they think like that. Um, that. Yes, there was a real stigma for, for some of those people. And it was related, I think, to them identifying us as the people in a sort of high school or secondary school and a people who you wouldn't want to be have to go along to because you know other students might look down on you for it. <clears throat> okay everyone so um, I'm about done and um, uh, I know there's a couple of people going to write something. Um, I don't know if you can hear in the background but I've got um, we've got our little um, chirpy little song telling us that we have to leave the centre in 15 minutes. I'm going off to see a production of King Lear later on, so um, I just hope they play it for laughs, you know, uh, summer evening entertainment over here in Auckland. Um, yeah, Ali, by the way, the um, workshops I gave, the um, lecturer actually sat in on two of these workshops and was together with the students doing the tasks, etc. And I think that did have the effect of um, showing the students, anyway, that there was a value in what I was doing. And if you like, bigging up my expertise in terms of um, uh, teaching uh, academic writing. Yeah, I mean that that issue of stigma, stigmatization, I think is just a long ongoing one, and I think it's um, it's our sort of um, rolling up, <coughs> rolling the 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 stone up the mountain overnight, and then getting up again and <laughs> getting down the bottom and pushing up the top again, and knowing that you do the same tomorrow. You know, that's uh, that's what it's like. That's our remedial stone, and uh, it's got gravity. It keeps wanting to fall down to the bottom, and we have to keep, you know, getting up again and pushing it up where it belongs, you know? So look, if any of you want to um, adopt some of that material, just let me know how it goes. And um, it's all work in progress. I'm hoping to write up um, an article on this topic at some point and generally to write up some things on the topic of um, sort of integrated learning and writing support during the next year. So, you know, anything, any more feedback you can give me on that issue would be really very welcome. And thank you, Margaret. Yeah, and I, I really feel that this area of reflective writing has great potential for us to move into, partly because it's, it's a growing field. Um, it's related to this vocational turn, which makes it um, seem uh, particularly valued, I think, within um, the tertiary sector as it is at the moment and it's an area where um, our help is I think very much appreciated um, because I think the um, the range of staff they realize that um, they may not have written reflectively back when they were students it's not like a lit review or an essay where um, they may feel that it's something that everyone should be able to do I think they very readily recognize that um, something something's needed 